Welcome to American Pulse. Um, law enforcement, FBI investigations, uh, all these things are here to protect citizens. I'm privileged and honored today uh, to interview uh, Mr. Thomas Masters. Uh, welcome to the show, Mr. Thomas. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Masters. Uh, Mr. Masters is the Executive Director of the National Asian Peace Officers Association uh, as an abbreviation for NAPOA. Um, this a association is dedicated to promoting the interest of Asian American police officers and federal agents serving at the local, state, and federal levels. Mr. Masters uh, served uh, for 30 years in the, government, the American government for the FBI um, Federal Bureau of Investigation as a special agent. Um, welcome again to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan. Um, Mr. Masters, uh, if you don't mind, if you can uh, um, tell my viewers about your background, uh, where you were born, where you were raised, and if there's anything exciting in the story. <laughs> As we discussed uh, initially, uh, I have the last name of Masters, which is not a typical Korean name. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate. Uh, as a uh, youth to be adopted into an American family. This is uh, after my parents uh, passed away I'm sorry during to hear the that. Korean sorry War. To hear that. Yeah. Uh, this is during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in 1953 and lived in an orphanage after they passed away. I have a brother and sister still in Korea. And as many of your listeners understand, War is a very tragic thing, and as a result, uh, you don't have to be in a combatant to suffer uh, the terrible tragedies of war. But uh, my mother actually committed suicide because of the fact that oh our family had been broken apart, and my father disappeared. And uh, for so many years, I've been searching for my brother and sister who are still back in Korea, and I think I'm getting a little bit closer. but. The reason why I point this out is because of the fact that this helped form and shape my beliefs today and uh, the ideas that I have with regards to peace and our role in resolving conflict around the world. And that's one of the reasons why I was very interested in joining in American law enforcement and the premier law enforcement agency, which is the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So immediately after college and then law school, I went to the University of Kansas School of Law. I was accepted by the FBI and uh, started investigations with the FBI. And for my viewers, if they haven't heard the FBI, I'm sure everybody hears it in the movies, this is the top level uh, service and you know for the for the government so this is you know something very solid that you were offered an opportunity and, and that tells a lot about your personality well thank you I I am very very proud of the service my service with the FBI and the opportunity to help citizens here in the United States as well as citizens around the world I um, I can't help it but touch on the fact that you lived in, in an orphanage home for six years. I mean, you know, I don't want to beat you to it, but I, it's, how did you feel back then? You know, one of the best things that could ever happen to an orphan was to finally be adopted by a family and become a part of a core group, have a mother, a father, and I just waited for the day that I would be able to be brought in to a family. It didn't matter who they were. You but, just uh, needed a father and a mom. Absolutely. And I I'll tell and you. And your brothers and sisters weren't fortunate enough to get the same. Uh, uh, no. No. Yeah. They weren't uh, fortunate enough uh, to be adopted. Um, they. Um, as far as my life was concerned, they disappeared from my life, but I have struggled all these years to try and locate them. And through recent tests and uh, research that uh, can be conducted, then I think I'm drawing closer to find where they're located. 
Oh, this is amazing. And, and the fact that you're still concerned and you want to reach out to them, that, that tells a lot about uh, how kind-hearted you are. And uh, you, you just don't want to leave them out and you want to reach out to them. Uh, reunion the family again, right? The Absolutely. Um, well, that takes us to the wars, and you just mentioned that wars are something really bad, and uh, it seems like, and, and I, you know, I was hoping that we'd talk about this at the end of the, of the episode, but now I'm forced to ask about, it seems like to me, and I might be wrong, that we're setting up for an actual World War III. Things are going crazy in the Middle East. Countries are, some certain countries are gathering together and certain countries are going away from each other. Uh, there's uh, instability in the balance of power in the world. So is that something right, is that a right feeling by on at any level, you think? Yes, I think you're correct, Dr. Morgan, mm -hmm. in feeling this way. However, based on my years of experience and uh, living here and being a student of history, I think that the world and world events, they seem to follow uh, cycles and patterns. Because I recall, especially with Egypt, that uh, when uh, Abdel uh, Nasser, when he was a president, and uh, there was always some tension. Um, and then you had uh, changes with Hosni Mubarak when he came to power yeah. uh, th over 30 years ago. But many of your viewers probably don't recall a lot of the problems and issues that may have occurred at that period. We had the uh, uh, disruptions between the, uh, the Arab states and Israel and Egypt, especially in '67, during yes. the in is, '73, and in, in, in the, the Arab-Israeli uh, conflicts and the wars and the devastation that occurred at that time. So I just see this as another period where we, as people who want to forge a better understanding and communication, need to educate ourselves about. What causes these conflicts? And how can we, as citizens of Egypt or the Middle East or here in the United States or the Far East, how can we deal with mitigating and reducing these conflicts uh, so that we will not be faced with the tragic events that war causes? Well, they say, in other words, uh, we know because we we strive and, and we struggle from from wars, but it's it, it. There's a saying that there are people in power benefit from wars, and they think that's economically profitable, and they get them to another level and keeps uh, the balance of powers in their favor. But this is on the expense of other people's lives. That's correct, and unfortunately it seems that there are profiteers who capitalize on the, the wages of war and what it does to the people in both developing countries and modern countries as well. Because you think about the billions, the trillions of dollars that are spent in waging war. And that in and of itself is a primary reason, in my estimation, that these wars can be protracted and continue for so long. Because mm -hmm. only a few people stand to benefit. But as I know from my personal experience, having been orphaned as a result of the Korean War, I know the devastation and damage that it causes all sides, both the victims and their families and the aggressors. Everybody's losing. Everybody's yes. losing. Um, what do we do to prevent this from happening? What do you think? What, what should we... In the 21st century, and we're still sh having people are being beheaded and burned alive. And what do we do? Number one solution is education. Mm -hmm. We need to educate those people who are influenced by whether it's Christian fundamentalists or whether it's by uh, radical and terrorist Islam and the imams who espouse uh, terror and radical acts. And this isn't only limited to uh, Islam. It also may permeate 
uh, the Christian uh, belief systems as well. I'm a follower of uh, Fatullah Gulen, who is a Turkish scholar. He espouses the Gulen movement, or Hizmet. And Hizmet has started schools, Islamic schools, in over 160 countries. And the reason why Fatullah Gulen and the Islamic uh, Gulen movement has started these schools is to educate those children who cannot read, cannot write, so they can forge and formulate their own ideas and their own beliefs. This is a very good strategy for the long term. What do we do for the immediate action? Because people are dying. And, and this is education, I, I believe it's the most essential uh, way of going about this. But now we have people that are telling us whether you follow my rules or I'll just chop off your head. What do you do with these people? That's a very unfortunate situation, but I don't know. Unfortunately, what we seem to look for as human beings is what's the quick answer, what's the quick solution. But with the conflicts in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, the conflicts that we face uh, globally, uh, in any type of conflict, there is not a clear-cut immediate solution. There's never, There's never a clear-cut immediate solution. But through education, through training, then we can get to a point where we know within ourselves and within our communities how best to address not just terrorist acts, but criminal acts. Because we may not be exposed to uh, a terrorist incident involving uh, improvised explosive device here in New York anytime in the near future, but it's not a matter of uh, if it will happen, but when it will happen. And what we need to do as an organization, as a society, and organizations within law enforcement, is to educate the population. Because through education, we may be able to prevent those immediate acts, mm -hmm. as you allude to. Yeah, well, there is a saying, uh, you know, and I had mentioned that to you earlier, that we had, you know, the police department and FBI and all the governmental uh, departments have to be right all the time, and terrorists yes. have to be only right one time to cause a problem. That's correct. And through education, through educating our citizenry here in the United States and educating citizens living around the world, we can help to stop, to mitigate a lot of the fallout and the damage uh, that's caused not just by international terrorists, but by our own domestic terrorists as well. I want to talk about the domestic terrorists because th there's a lot to say about the international terrorism, so we'll get to it. Uh, but it seems like in New York, and I, I want to use New York as an example, that in the past few months there's a lot of tension between the police officers and also at Ferguson and in, uh, in, uh, Miss, uh, Missouri. Uh, there's a, t a lot of tension between police officers and citizens and and it seemed to me like you know I think everybody forgot their role and they forgot who's supposed to do what and how some officers are trying to do what they're supposed to do but some are abusing the the power as based on you know people complaints and uh, and some people are not don't, they don't want the officers to interfere in their life period even if they do something wrong which is of course crazy so what caused that tension and what did we do to calm it down because th it looks like things are back to normal now well dr morgan i think what we need to do first and foremost is to look at the number of incidents that occur here in the United States alone with the local, state, and federal law enforcement officers who risk their lives every day to stop criminal acts. We probably have 40,000 plus arrests a day of citizens here 40, in the United States. Yes. Statistically, that's what we're looking at wow, about incidents crazy. involving police officers with the local community. 40,000 arrests. Out of that 40,000, 
we may have. And that's in New York or no, globally? No, that's around, federal? The, around uh, the country. Uh, around the country. Around the country. Okay. okay. And so still out a lot. of that, I mean, yeah, still that's still a tremendous, a tremendous <laughs> number. Yeah. Uh, when you I never at, imagined. Uh, look at the population here in the United States of 300 million people. Hmm. So out of that number of arrests, to have just a handful that surface to the level of national media attention, you have to keep that frame of reference. And you have to look at that from a realistic perspective. Asian Americans, unfortunately, within the last year, Asian American law enforcement officers have started coming to the forefront. And we know that uh, just a few months ago, unfortunately, with the, with the murder of uh, Detective Wen Jin Liu yes. here with NYPD, New York City Police Department, it was, it was very sad. the terrible assassination of two police officers. Yes. And that's the counterpoint to a lot of the violence that people read about in national media is the terrible uh, the violence that's inflicted on police officers. Uh, it's, uh, it's something to be very cognizant of because although police officers are viewed um, with some trepidation and they're viewed, for example, in Ferguson, that incident, Staten Island, uh, with the uh, deaths. Yeah, that was uh, of African American really males. Bad. That was really bad in Staten Island. We also have to realize that police officers put themselves in harm's way each and yeah. every day, as we saw with Detective Liu. Now, of course, uh, just last week there was an incident involving another New York City police officer, Asian American, who was indicted, uh, Peter Leung, for the shooting of a young black male here in New York City. So it became very racial recently. Is that what you're trying to get to? Well, I think um, if you look at it, not from a racial perspective, it's police officers mm -hmm. who are confronting uh, civilians. So you can look at that as racial, but I don't look at it that way. I yeah. look at it... No, I don't. I don't, yes. but I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say, the public is looking at it as racial. Yes. Um, some members of the public some may members. look at it. Okay. I just wanted to clarify yes. to my viewers yes. how things are here. So you know, um, because you have uh, in every society, you have people who thrive on conflict. Mm -hmm. You have instigators who promote the racist agenda. Yes, they like to, they 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 benefit somehow. Yes, from doing that, and I don't know how, but somehow yes. they benefit. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. unfortunately, in the case of Wen Jin Liu. Detective Liu was a member of our local chapter mm -hmm. of the Asian Jade Society, which is the Asian American police officers within the New York City Police Department. I want to talk about uh, that incident right after we come back from this break. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, we're back with the Mr. Masters and uh, we're talking about the incidents uh, that happened uh, with the police officer, uh, Chandu. Uh, so if you can tell us exactly what happened so my viewers will understand how was he uh, assassinated by people from the public. Um, officer, police officer Wen Jin Liu, member of the New York City Police Department, was seated in his vehicle with a partner who was a Hispanic American police officer, and they were gunned down uh, by an African American while uh, police officer Lou uh, was simply taking care of one of the projects within the city of New York. It was completely unexpected. However, the So there was no interaction before with, with this particular uh, shooter, did they aggravate him in any ways? Not at all. Not yeah, at they all. Were Just the fact he wanted to kill a police officer. They were caught totally unaware. Oh my gosh, that's bad. There was information posted on the perpetrator's website 
I believe it was a Facebook or Twitter page that indicated that he wanted uh, to kill police officers. Just anyone he yes. see, he'll just kill them. It was just a random act directed specifically it, against police is it officers. In, uh, as a reaction to what happened in Ferguson, he thinks that the police officers are killing uh, African Americans. That's that, uh, that is really that's or? really uh, unclear at this point what the psychology mm -hmm. of the perpetrator was at the time. Um, it could be, but I would uh, not want to speculate about that. Yes, uh, because there are a number of things that uh, people do that's completely contrary to our moral codes and the law. And it's uh, I remember reading about uh, the Talking Heads who commented that this, this never happened uh, as far as their experience was concerned. But I remember specifically that as a young police officer serving back in Wichita, Kansas in 1977, there was a police officer who was a very close friend of mine um, and uh, Paul Garofalo who was seated in a police vehicle along with his partner and he was gunned down and targeted by a, a black male perpetrator who had no interaction except the fact that he wanted to kill police officers. So it was the ideology, in other words. Yes. Um, so can you, do you mind if you explain to my viewers how is the police system here, the US works, and how does, does or does not interact with other agencies like FBI, CIA at any levels, and, and what happens to the dom domestic threats and the international threats? How, how is this all planned out and structured here at the US? In the United States, there are three or four distinct levels of law enforcement. You have the local law enforcement officers or agencies at the city level. You have the county level as well within uh, county areas. You have the state police, and they have uh, state highway patrol, they have state police and state investigators. And finally, you have the federal agencies, which have jurisdiction over uh, rule of law for federal statutes and federal All codes. All the states. Uh, and uh, this encompasses the entire United States. Yes. No single agency has more power or more authority than any other. Okay. A lot of times the people would uh, say, well, the FBI seems to have more jurisdiction than mm -hmm. anyone else. As a matter of fact, it's the local police officer who can enforce and has more statutory authority than even the FBI oh. because of the fact that they can enforce someone acting disorderly in public all the way up to investigating homicides. So the local, state, and federal officials are all bound to investigate statutes for which they have the authority to investigate those those statutes. Is there any communication at any level? Is it like is the communication on uh, on officer to an officer level or to a, a supervisor to a supervisor or department to a department level? How does this communication between these different agencies? Well. There are two different questions that you pose here, Dr. Mm -hmm. Morgan. Number one, what's the communication like interagency? Yes. Uh, and in tr intra-agency, you have chains of command, where the uh, police commissioner, for example, in so the whole hierarchy. Yes, in the city of New York, mm -hmm. uh, they are selected by the mayor of the city of New York, and so that police commissioner is the head of the New York City Police Department. Mm -hmm. And the police commissioner uh, dictates and passes down rules uh, for strict compliance by their police officers. Mm -hmm. At the uh, state level, the uh, sheriff of each county is the law enforcement authority for each of the counties. And then at the uh, higher level at the state, the governor uh, has jurisdiction for selecting uh, and working with the local attorneys general who are oftentimes elected by uh, the residents of the state. And of course, we turn to the federal level 
And at the federal level, you have the President of the United States who nominates the U.S. Attorney General for positions. As far as communication between each of the local, state, and federal jurisdictions, I can tell you from experience that prior to 9-11, yes. prior to 9-11, the communication between the local, state, and federal agencies was less. And that's what I was getting to. I wanted to know how did that happen? How yes. can a great country like the USA would fall into that trap of lack of communication between the agencies? Yes, because even when I started my law enforcement career back in 1977 as a police officer, there was very little communication between the federal agencies and the and local, local police departments. Police. But after 9-11, when we discovered within the law enforcement community that there was minimal sharing of information. The FBI and the federal agencies literally kicked the door, doors of information off their hinges in order to get information out to the local and state agencies because they knew that it was imperative and critical to get this information out to people at the local levels. Do you think uh, if we had the same communication we have now, back then in 2001, we would have been uh, able to avoid the attack for 9-11? It appears if from the statements from the 9-11 Commission that there was information that our intelligence community had uh, that they did not share sure. with the FBI. And there was also information that the FBI had that they, did not share. that they didn't share. Even within the FBI, I recall specific instances where information was shared, but not sufficient. But oftentimes it was being mishandled. Mm. I remember specifically the case of Colleen Rowley, who was a special agent with the FBI, assigned to the New York office, and then she was transferred out to Minneapolis and she was a whistleblower. And she talked about the training of Muslims to fly aircraft. She did. And she did, and she made the cover of Time Magazine. But she, oh, uh, I knew Colleen uh, personally, we worked together in New York, and she was a stellar FBI agent. She had 19 years on in the FBI, ready to retire. She was an attorney as well, a mother, a phenomenal agent. And I knew that she had everything to risk and almost nothing to gain by calling attention to the fact that even within the FBI, we often mishandled and mismanaged some of the information. But we have a completely different era where the FBI is now working with counterterrorist groups, have brought in uh, different members, investigators, from the various law enforcement agencies at the local, state, and federal levels to work within the FBI mm -hmm. in order to better share the information that they have. Uh, about processes, about uh, prosecution, and uh, methods and strategies to mitigate the terrible effects of a potential terrorist catastrophe. Um, thank God we, in the last 12, 13 years, we didn't have any big incidents or even smaller incidents like 9-11. Uh, except Boston attack and uh, it seemed like we've done something right. Is it better communication or did we throw the ball in a different field so the battle is not here, the battle somewhere else in the Middle East? I think it's a number of factors that contribute to law enforcement's ability. Remember too that in law enforcement Law enforcement agencies are only as good as the information they receive. And in almost 100% of those cases, uh, it wasn't the law enforcement agency that uncovered that information. A lot of that information was, re was located, revealed, and shared by people in the community. 
Back in the early 70s, 1970, law enforcement agencies initiated crime prevention programs and community policing because even today there aren't enough police officers and law enforcement officials uh, to monitor the activities of people in the community. And it's been as a result of education and educating the community and people in the community that law enforcement has been able to obtain valuable information that can lead to the arrest and prosecution of domestic and international terrorists. So what you're trying to say is it's very important for the average individual to be tuned in to the law enforcement yes. channel, you know, speak about things that they see, report things that they question, so this way it gives, if you give more information to the law enforcement, we we'll most probably come up with the better results. Right? Absolutely, and that's precisely the point the reason why education is first and foremost uh, the most important aspect of discovering where the next terrorist attack is going to occur. Because if we educate the people to look for these perpetrators, suspects who are planning these terrorist attacks, whether domestic or international, that's the weakest point where you conduct surveillance at the pre-planning stage and then report that to local law enforcement. But I feel that this only alone is not enough for the magnificent job we've done. I think we've done more things, and I don't know what they are. <laughs> well, the FBI has been very effective in arrest of people planning Terrorist yeah. incidents. I, I think I think I can testify to that because I know the the guys that performed the terrorist attack in Paris were on the no fly list uh, of the American government. That we knew about them a while back, and we forbade them from flying on airplanes because we know that they're no good news that can ever come from these guys. Correct. And uh, again, it's important for the federal agencies to share this information. Very important. Yes. At this level, maybe also internationally, because we knew about it. I don't know what France, whether France knew about it or not, but I think they could have benefited more if they were aware of the danger that can come from these guys. Well, uh, I can speak on behalf of the FBI, but I know that within several of the other U.S. federal agencies. They have agents assigned worldwide to American embassies to serve uh, within the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, to serve within uh, Interpol, and a lot of the other uh, organizations that are targeting uh, terrorist acts to reduce and mitigate the damage of uh, potential terrorism uh, across uh, the United States as well as other parts of the world. And it's this information network that has developed as a result of close contact networking and communications that will be the solution to help curb uh, the acts, numbers of acts of violence that we see here today. Sure. Uh, at a certain point in, in your career in life, you moved to be a founder partner of Rainbow Vision USA, uh, and then you came back again to FBI after the 9-11 attack. What made you leave and what made you come back? Well, I was always interested in working in international trade, and uh, I departed from the FBI because I received an offer to work with an international trade consulting group. And the, the pay was tremendous because... Something you cannot say no to. No. <laughs> and um, as a young man, I, I looked at that and then having to care for my family. Sure. And with expenses. It's also ambitious, you know, for you to take it to the next level. Yes. You know, use what you know and how you handle things. And uh, but I was very, very satisfied working with the FBI. I uh, started Rainbow Vision, and it was an international trade consulting group that was headquartered here in New York. And on that terrible day, on September 11th in 2001, as I was traveling into my office, uh, awaiting to go through the Lincoln Tunnel, I witnessed uh, the first aircraft 
Oh, so you saw the first one? Yourself? Yes, I did. Um, oh, that must be horrible. And um, I saw it from a distance, and I thought it was a one of the tourist planes that just traveled up and down the Hudson River. Yeah. And I called my father, and he said he was watching it on the news. My father is in Kansas, and he relayed that information, and I uh, immediately I jumped to the conclusion that it was one of the small tourist aircraft. And as I was talking to my father, the second plane struck the South Tower. I saw that on TV because when I got to the office, I was able to see it. we were watching the fire in the first tower, yes. and then we see a plane flying into the second tower. Like, wait yes. a minute, what what is going on? And then we see the title: America is under attack. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I knew at that point that that wasn't an accident. Yeah. Because I had also been involved uh, when I was with the FBI uh, back in 1993 on the first attack on the World Trade Center in February yeah. of 1993. When they tried from yes. downstairs into yes. the bottom of the building. And then I had turned uh, away from the Lincoln Tunnel and was headed back uh, uh, to New Jersey and never made it across the Hudson River on that day. But I was... Uh, I was completely devastated yeah. and dysfunctional for about uh, the next uh, four days. I just glued to the television and watching what was yes. happening at the World Trade too Center hard, and the Pentagon. Too and much the to digest. Yeah, yes. too much to digest. And I had contact with my friends in the FBI, with people that were serving in the military, and they were doing their part in trying to see uh, how this could happen. And uh, involved with the war on terrorism because we sh don't let anyone kid you we were at war at that time yes and so i i think everything started at that time or the confrontation started at that time um well uh, a major part uh, i think our eyes were open to the fact mm -hmm. that uh, we were a major target I think under uh, President Bill Clinton, when he and the intelligence community, they were aware of the acts against the United States. There were a number of incidents that the United States was involved with. Not as highly publicized, of course, as what had occurred uh, during 9-11. But I had been involved with uh, law enforcement enough to know that uh, even back in October of 1985, when the Palestine Liberation Front had taken over the Achille Laurel, and an American citizen, uh, Klinghoffer, had been thrown overboard. He was a handicapped, uh, uh, paraplegic uh, U.S. citizen had been thrown over. Uh, that was just another of many incidents Indications. To yeah, indications of, of how the United States uh, was hated uh, by many, many of the countries around the world. And why is that? I, this is a very important question. Why were we hated by many countries? I think because... At least from your perspective. From my perspective, I think when you're at the very top, economically, socially, um, Jealousy. politically, it is. It's, it's, uh, that's, the, that's the key. People are jealous of what we have. They're jealous because they don't have it, and they strive to attain it, but frustration. Uh, they need a scapegoat for their own trials and tribulations and lack of, uh, uh, lack of social infrastructure. Uh, they're jealous. And, of course, the United States is a very, very easy target because we are followed. We govern and we follow the rule of law. Yeah, I want to talk about that right after the break. So welcome back with, uh, we're continuing with uh, Mr. Uh, Masters on his very invaluable information about what happened in 9-11 and uh, how he felt. So uh, we were talking about why we were hated as Americans in the USA and you, you mentioned that part of it, the first thing was jealousy because we're at the top, we're, we have the law enforcement, we do everything right and we do it the right way. Uh, do you think of any other reasons why we've been hated? Well, from the 
a Middle Eastern perspective, it's because uh, the United States has developed close relationships with certain nations, yeah. and I'm speaking directly about our relationship with Israel. Yeah. I think that because uh, Israel is one of our strongest allies in the Middle East, mm -hmm. but that's understood by many Americans. But we also have a very strong ally in Turkey, which is uh, Islamic State. Yeah. But I think the way, since I was born and raised in the Middle East, and the way they picture it is, and I, you know, I can see that in a way, is that America is backing up Israel no matter yes. what. Yes. And the problem is the word no matter what. I mean, I think people might not have a problem with America is uh, backing up Israel if you know if there is a need to, but if if it just out there, you know, in the open. I had a meeting, I had a, uh, a sh an episode with one of the ambassadors who happened to be American ambassador in Egypt, and then he went to Israel, and he had um, uh, Israeli backgrounds, and he told me it is what it is. You know, <laughs> and I think that's uh, quite aggravating to a lot of people. You know, it is what it is that we have strong yes. ties. America will do whatever Israel wants to, to have. And I think it's a little bit of a strong statement. I think we need to go back to my original uh, statement about the importance of education. Education. And I think we need to educate uh, the American public mm -hmm. about the value of international dialogue, that it's important to have not just that international dialogue, but when you look at the reason for conflict in the Middle East, much of it is faith-based, and we need to have an interfaith dialogue yes. among important. religions. It is very important. Do you think also we hate it because, you know, some people say that we stick our nose where it doesn't belong? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm a f I believe that because there's... Uh, I mean, there was no reason to go to Iraq, for instance, for, no. God, you know, for God's no. sake. I mean, we created a monster that we can't get rid of right now, right? And that may go back to your statement about the interest of those who can benefit from the suffering of others through capitalist trade uh, for weapons and to uh, exploit uh, those different countries needs for weapons because if there were no weapons we would not have the oh, right. terrible conflicts that we have mm -hmm. around the world we yeah. might have to revert back to throwing stones or rocks or spears or whatever it might be but that again goes back to the importance of dialogue international dialogue and interfaith dialogue. I want to come to that point, but uh, let's divert in a little bit because, you know, I had a crazy idea if, you know, and it's obviously it's impossible to do, if we have a common law and internationally says nobody's supposed to produce any weapons, no more weapons in the world. I don't know if, if that could ever happen. <laughs> I think it's realistic, <laughs> but it would, be, it would be awesome. I mean, it would, you know... It would uh, decrease and you know, lessen the amount of destruction and people dying every every year and every day. Well, we're talking about uh, weapons of modern war and modern warfare. The level of destruction caused by the atomic bomb, yeah. as those who lived in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, can attest to, that was devastating. Yeah. However, if you look at history, and I mentioned I'm a student of history, if you look at the amount of devastation, the number of people killed in wars prior to the use of modern Definitely. weapons, yeah. it was even greater yeah. as far as a percentage. I, I want to I close my eyes and open it again, and I see the weapons are, the, moder the real modern weapons would be technology, research, education. This is, I think that would be a much stronger weapon uh, for for countries to uh, prevail and to be stronger than others, and it, you know instead of just killing people and shedding their bloods the the way we saw it on TV and everything else. Yes, and not that I'm a proponent of nuclear weapons, but I think with the knowledge that we have about the devastating effect of modern warfare and modern weapons, that serves to prevent people from engaging in this type of bitter conflict, Yes. ultimately. Um, 
Do you have uh, philosophy, professional philosophy? I would like to state it to my viewers. Um, having served as a senior manager in law enforcement and the corporate sector over the past 30 years, I believe in the value of working collaboratively with others to leverage their strengths and minimize their weaknesses and the pursuit of common goal. I believe people are our greatest assets and that through positive direction and support, no objective is beyond reach. This is amazing. I firmly believe that as an individual, we can do things quickly and we can run fast, but united as a group, as a team, we can run far. And that's always been my philosophy. We need to gather our resources together to work as a team, as a, as a group, to help solve the world's problems. Through education, we can defeat hunger. Through education, can we can... Terrorism, we can defeat terrorism, for we sure. We can defeat terrorism. Yeah. We can teach people to read. Peace. To promote uh, peace. And, and to promote peace and to develop their own ideologies and not have to listen and blindly and to be led blindly by the people who would do them harm. And that's why I named the first American Pulse Symposium that was held in, uh, uh, in February of 2015, United We Stand. This is, the, this is the title of the symposium, United We Stand, because at this point, you're right, you know, I can do a good job on my own, you can do a good job on your own, but we don't get far enough. But if we're collaborative and we're working together, we'll, we'll reach faster and stronger, where we can maintain what we get. Um, do you think, uh, I, before I go to if there's any Middle Eastern opportunities for officers to come to the law enforcement. I want to know how did you go back and why to uh, the FBI uh, Bureau, Bureau of Investigation right after the attack. Uh, as I indicated, I've, I felt dysfunctional. Um, I was working uh, with my company, Rainbow Vision, and I was delayed from traveling to Oklahoma City where we had our next major event uh, with the Rainbow Vision. And finally, when I did, uh, when, the, when the, uh, the bar against aircraft flying was lifted, then I got onto an aircraft and I flew over the World Trade Center from Newark Airport. And I looked down to see the devastating impact of 9-11. Disaster. It was. It was. It was so terrible that words cannot adequately express uh, how I felt that yeah. day. So, when I returned from Oklahoma City back to New Jersey at uh, Newark Airport, I called a friend of mine who you felt it right there in your heart. You gotta. You gotta do the right thing. Yes. Call. And I decided that I was going to to go back into into government to see what I could do. And I was ready to go anywhere. I contacted a friend of mine with the FBI, a senior manager, and unfortunately, because of my age, I was not allowed to go back into the FBI because of their mandatory retire mm -hmm. retirement rules. And I looked and found that the Federal Air Marshal Service was hiring. And they were desperate for experienced managers and federal air marshals. And they had increased the age for mandatory retirement. Mm. That worked perfectly. It did. You. And so, therefore, I was qualified. And well, I, anyway, if you had sent them a picture of yours, they wouldn't have even thought about the uh, mandatory retirement. You look so young. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so... And so, um, as a result, I applied and was uh, immediately accepted into the Federal Air Marshal Service. And uh, I was willing to travel and do anything I needed to do Possibly, on behalf of the country. And I was very fortunate. you felt good about it, right? Yes. It's, it's important. And within three months, um, I was brought down to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. to head up the IT department um, under Director Tom Quinn at the time. And I immediately thought that uh, IT 
was international terrorism. But unbeknownst to me, it actually was the infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure support mm -hmm. uh, and technology division, technology. IT. IT infrastructure, yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, because of my background with yes. Rainbow Vision and uh, my background in uh, electronics. Uh, now, do you think there's a room for Middle Easterns and Egyptians and Arabs to come and help out in the law enforcement here in the U.S. to try to combat terrorism since they been lived around those people and know these people, know how they think? Um, not only is there a need, there is a desperate need for Arabic speakers within law enforcement and the intelligence community. I recall the information that we received uh, immediately following 9-11, and our intelligence community had an absolute shortage of Arabic and Middle Eastern language speakers. And yeah, I remember that there was uh, an urge of hiring so many people. I had a feeling that wasn't also the right decision to make right away because I think they acquired some of the people that worked against the system and delayed everything else. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> if you look at the cost-benefit analysis, the cost to the, the government uh, at the local, state, and federal levels is minimal when you look at the benefit, the benefit. of uh, Arabic speakers, of yeah. the Middle Eastern speakers that we were able to bring on board. And one of the uh, things that I'm very proud about, uh, serving as the executive director of the National Asian Peace Officers Association, is that we have a number of strong candidates for positions within local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. As a matter of fact, I mentor to a number of Egyptian, uh, well-qualified Egyptian candidates with their college degrees, some of them with their law degrees, mm -hmm. who are looking at uh, prestigious positions mm -hmm. uh, within not just the FBI, but several of the other law enforcement agencies, mm -hmm. including uh, NCIS, Naval Criminal Investigative Service, mm -hmm. within Homeland Security Investigations. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the Homeland Security because when I came to the States, it used to be called INS, yes. Immigration and Naturalization Services. Yes. And now it's Homeland Security, USCIS. Uh, when did this change happen and why and how it's working? Uh, this happened immediately following 9-11 in yeah. 2001. I remember it was like a few weeks or a few days yes. maybe. Right and it was uh, modeled after the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. And that uh, agency's incorporation of all of the disparate military groups. Because after World War II, there was really no need in having all of the various organizations uh, as their own separate entity. Yeah. So the Department of Defense was formed in order to bring in the United States Air Force, the Army, the Navy, and then the Coast Guard. But now, after 9-11, because of the fact that you pointed out, we had so many disparate organizations that weren't communicating with each other. By presidential directive and congressional approval, uh, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security was formed. And within the Department of Homeland Security, you not only have the old Immigration and Naturalization Service, you also have the U.S. Coast Guard as a very large component of the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the U.S. Secret Service, the Transportation Security Administration, which is the largest of the civilian agencies, and those are the screeners that you see at the airports that cause so much trouble for travelers. Yes, and it costs so much money on, on you know, yes. uh, but it's very important. But as you indicated, it's very important. The, the men and women of the Transportation Security Administration, the screeners, yeah. they have literally an impossible job of not just finding a needle in a haystack, but finding pieces of a needle in yes. a haystack. Yes, I remember the plot that was uh, uncovered in, uh, by the British uh, government where they had 10 different people or more flying from the different uh, aircrafts and they had, everybody had like a part of the bomb and they were going to put it together and just, uh, I think they were planning to uh, 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 make the, the, this bomb in, uh, in JFK. 
and it, it's amazing yes. that I was amazed how they would be able to you know see this separately and see the big picture and and get them from different flights it's, it's amazing uh, that's that's correct and you're talking about yeah. having to find the pieces yes of pieces of the pieces the yes. pieces and that was the liquid bomb plot yes. that you're referring yes. to that yes. occurred back in 2005 yes and that ever since they banned us from uh, traveling yes. with water and juice and things like that's that. correct yeah. but the tsa and the screeners and the u.s government in general the agents and the law enforcement officials within the federal agencies, the local and state agencies, they have to be right 100% of the time. All the time. All the time. And it really is. I don't believe that TSA and the it's screeners hard. Hard. Uh, are given adequate uh, recognition for their efforts yeah. Yeah. in that regard. Yeah, I think, yes, you're right. They have to be 100%, and yes. uh, it only takes one mistake. Right. But referring back to the opportunities within law enforcement, um, there are a number of very, very qualified Middle Eastern candidates. As a matter of fact, uh, this evening uh, I'll be attending a career development program in uh, Morris County, New Jersey. It's a 12-week long program, and this is open to college-age students and graduates who are interested in careers in law enforcement, and in government, and we provide them with the information, the tools, and the wherewithal, and the uh, information that they need in order to apply and make themselves highly qualified candidates. That's great. It's awesome. Um, what does an average uh, American citizen need to do to protect himself and protect his country from the current threats that we hear on TV and radio and they want to bomb the American Mall in Minnesota and this and that. What do we need to do? Number one, again, I go back to education. Education, <laughs> education is very important to find out uh, yeah. what's the difference between um, a Sunni, a Shiite. But it, it goes far beyond that. You know, because we see um, uh, we see Indians, uh, Pakistanis, uh, for example, who are targeted uh, because they may wear uh, certain towels, certain uh, yeah, customs. The Sikh, the, Sikh, the, Sikh uh, yeah, the Sikh community. They may be targeted. People were murdered uh, after 9-11 because yes. some people mistaken them for like Muslim terrorists and yes. they killed them and they had nothing to do when with it. When in fact they weren't. Yeah. And that's why it is so important for us to be able to distinguish um, our friends from enemies. You know, I recall the situation with the Oklahoma City bombing, and that was back in April of 1995. And, you know, here I was, a trained FBI agent, and I immediately thought of international terrorists who had targeted Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. But I was mistaken, because it wasn't international terrorism at all. It was domestic terrorists. But that's one of the things we need to overcome, is this barrier to being flexible in our thinking and to not look at everything with a one-sided perspective. We need to be very dynamic in our thinking and in our investigation sure. to be open to the possibility that there may be those among us who yes. grew up here um, who are supposed to follow our rule of law but they are Americans uh, from Oklahoma, like uh, Timothy McVeigh, yeah. who mean to cause us harm. Yeah. And having been born in Seoul, Korea, and having met a number of uh, Asian Americans, and being very involved with the international community, there are people who are immigrants that I know, and myself included, who have a love for this country, yeah. who have a stronger love because we know that this is the country that nurtured us, cared for us, brought us here. Yes. And we are very, very grateful for the advantages, the benefits that this country has, ha has offered to us. Yes. Uh, Mr. Masters, uh, thank you very much for coming to our show. And uh, you have a very good story. Keep doing the good work. And I think uh, we need your expertise and experience and uh, your 
positive attitude and, and spirit. So thanks a lot. Well, thank you for this opportunity, Dr. Morgan. Yeah.